Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Three Village Historical Society, for having us here. I'm thankful for this one day, even that we are able to speak about it because it just emphasizes how one stone, one good deed, one person can make such a phenomenal difference. We're here to honor and share his legacy that has gone on for many years after him and God willing will continue on. Being new to the area, please forgive me if there's anything that in my portion of the presentation I failed to mention, okay, charge it to the head and not to the heart. I'm going to deal with the beginning. I'm going to deal with the history of Alfred Hobbs. So I'm going to deal with his story going from 1906 ending in 2006. So clearly, since we know he passed way before uh, about 10 years prior to 2006, I'm going to talk about a little bit of the beginning, I guess, of the farm before I turn it over to Brother Manning. Alfred Hobbs, as many of you know, was born in 1906. He was the son of James Henry Hobbs, as well as Annie Hobbs. And Annie and James had eight children. When they came to Long Island, they already had eight children in 1906. And they migrated here from Macon, Georgia. The family lived first on Pond Path at the Chandler Place. And their four additional children, uh, I'm understanding, were born. Now, I understand the records go back that say that they had migrated in 1906, but I did receive a recording uh, from Alfred's own words where he says that actually he was not born in um, Long Island, but he was actually born in Georgia. And so he migrated here at that time himself. Let me see if I can get this to play. Now, you say you were born in San Francisco. No, I was born in Georgia. Uh, Macon, Georgia, when I was, uh, I came here when I was six months old, right? 1907. There is a recording. He did so much work in the community, so much work learning about farming and different things. His father, however, passed in 1929. He was found on thanks, uh, he was found in a car on his way back from New York City. What he did was travel to New York City to sell a lot of his produce. From what I understand from Alfred Hobbs, he actually took about seven hours for him to make that trip in the vehicle they had back in this era of time. Back in 1924, I bought a Model T uh, Ford truck. And then I started going to market, Wallabout Market. That was on Flushing Avenue in Brooklyn. That must have been a two-day trip. No, it took me seven to eight hours to go from my house the Wallabout Market on Flushing Avenue. After his uh, death in 1929, he actually took over the farm, we're told, in 1930. He actually took over the farm and began to work the farm. In 1941 to 1945, his farm became what we now know or call today a victory farm, where much of the produce that was raised, much of the produce that that he a harvest did he actually gave to the U.S. Army to feed the troops. I'm understanding, and I know that I have somebody here who could speak to that a little bit more. Not only was he a great farmer, but he had a heart of community. He uh, went door to door to sell his produce. There were many families that weren't able to pay him. It was the IOU system. And from a recording I heard of him, there were many families that were never able to pay him. That did not stop him from still going from door to door, from one county, from town to another town to make sure he could sell his produce, even if it, he never got paid for that. I understand he did a lot to help the people in his community financially from the money that he made on the farm while he was still yet alive. In 1955, he began to purchase the farm from his other siblings. Understand they had 12 children in total. When his father died, I think each child probably still had a parcel of land. He began to purchase the land from each one of the siblings so that by the time he died, he had full ownership. There was no legal claim. Anybody could make a claim. I understand that it might have been not siblings, but the, the, the children thereof who were trying to make a claim, but there was no legal claim because he had literally uh, and legally purchased every plot of land from his siblings uh, prior to his death so that he was indeed the sole owner. 
of the 11 acres of land. He did get married. I don't have the year that he got married to his first wife. His first wife was Salore. He met her. She lived in New Jersey while he was here in Long Island. He was working for a particular man during this time and he had the day off, but the man said, you know, I'm gonna need you to work this day. He said, well, I can't work. I'm going to New Jersey to meet my woman to get my girl. And he actually said to him, if you don't show up for work, you're fired but he had such a good work ethic, I could only assume because out of Albert Hobbs' own mouth, he says, the man says, you will never work for me again if you don't come on this day. He said, however, I'm not saying we won't do business again. Just you won't work for me. And from how Alfred Hobbs shares it, the man spoke into his life and says, you're not gonna work for anybody. You're gonna, you're gonna own your own business. Like you're gonna be self-employed. And we see that that truly did come to pass. So again, he went, he had a good time with Salor, uh, presumably before they were married. He said on the train ride home, he was all happy. And then he remembered, oh, wait, I don't have a job. <laughs> but that, as we know from history, did not stop him. They are buried together. And I want to get this information correct since I am here with the Three Village Historical Society. So you're not here just to hear information, but you want the facts. He is married with his first wife, Salor, in Washington Memorial Park in Quorum. Okay, so we're here today when we talk about Bethel Hobbs Farm, we're talking about the legacy of this man right here, Alfred Hobbs, who, who will hear all that he did, how Bethel Amy Church received, but it's because of the work and it's because of his heart for farming, his gift for farming, and his gift to feed those and be in community and even help the least of these, not just about monetary gain. And so right now, I'm going to have Brother Manning come, who is one of the trustees at Bethel Hobbs Farm. That's right, you can go ahead if somebody, I don't know if you dropped something or gave a hand clap of praise, but we can do that as well, amen? And he's gonna talk about transition. Okay, I'm gonna to talk tonight about the transition, the transformation of what once was Hobbs Farm to what happened to be a place where it was dormant and nothing was happening until the community stepped in. The church did get the property, but at the time, not in a position to farm the, the land. What happened was when he got sick in 1995, he was working the land up until that time. Then he became very ill and he no longer could work the farm. The farm then, the, the operation discontinued. Now this is a slide where you'll hear Ann Pellegrino who later got involved, which I will tell you about, and what was occurring at the time. It was caught up in court battles, which I didn't know for oh, over okay. six years. So um, they couldn't do anything to it, even if they wanted to. Um, and in that six year period, it became vandalized. The house on the property was totally destroyed. Um, all of Mr. Hobbs's equipment was stolen. Um, the, I, we don't even know what happened to the greenhouse and it, the property was just in a disarray. So, but mm -hmm. um, it's come well, a long way. <laughs> it's come a very long, long way. way. So, yeah. How many years ago were you talking with this? Ah, uh, that was in April, 2007. Yeah, okay. Now this is what the farm looked like before we were able to move forward and be able to do the work that's required on the farm. The church and community members in 1996 formed Save the Farm. And what they were dealing with were two things mainly. Raising funds to pay the back taxes, which were about $8,000. And at that time, even now, $8,000 is $8,000. They were also, they also got together to stop the dumping that was happening on the farm. Now this in Suffolk County, if you see wide open land like this, some people, think it's okay to dump trash and garbage there. And that's what happened. 
What also happened was the buildings on the farm were not really kept up and they began to dilapidate. As I said, the farm, the, the church struggled with developers to make sure that they could secure and, and keep this a farm. Next slide. Reverend Leonard and Assistant Pastor Reverend Sandra Leonard were instrumental in making sure that this legacy continued. And they worked hard for that to happen. Now, the legal transfer of the property was finalized in 1998. Although that happened, that did not stop the developers for still trying to get this land and purchase it and take it from the church. That lasted until 2006, when they continued to try to get and, and purchase this land. So in this particular clip, Anne is beginning to tell about how she came about getting involved with the farm. When I was younger, I was a single mom with three kids. Um, and even though I was working two jobs, I, uh, I still had to visit food pantries. And I was very appreciative of the stuff that you got from there, but it, a lot of it was box stuff, stuff that would fill your belly, but really didn't have any nutritional value. Um, so I just felt like I needed to do something. And I rented a rototilla and I tore up my manicured backyard. And um, I just felt like I was gonna plant a garden and feed people. He came home and he was like, seriously, like how many people do you really think you're going to feed, you know? And it, it made me stop and think about it for a minute. I remembered the street, uh, the um, farm down the street from my house, um, which is in walking distance. When I, I grew up in Center Reach and it was always a working farm. And um, I was just like, you know what? If we could figure out who owns that farm, we could feed a lot of people. And, you know, that's, What's the beginning? That's great. <laughs> wow. In early 2007, after this conversation, one night, Anne went for a walk. She was walking and she was praying. She was praying and she was walking. And when she realized where she was, her prayers took her to the farm, which was right down the street from where she lived. And when she got there, she realized that this was the place, if she could find out who the owners were, this was the place that she could grow enough food to help people. And what happened? She then went and she started Friends of the Farm. The majority of those people were from Center Reach. And that was because the farm was in their neighborhood and they remembered what it was and they knew what it could be. And after that, she went and met with Reverend Leonard and Reverend Sandra. And they went, she went and asked if she could actually farm the land. She was given a 50 by 50 foot lot in order to start. Now, a little twist in the story. I told you about Greg, but Greg also had a dream about the farm. Every day between 1997 and 2006, on his way to work, he would pass the farm. He saw it overgrown, he saw everything happening. And what he said to himself was, one of these days I'm gonna clear that land. Mm -hmm. Now, he's a businessman, so he wasn't gonna clear it for free. His idea was that he was going to get a good payment for clearing the land. Little did he know that his wife had already met with the owners. And she told him, I met with the owners. 
And here's what we have to do. I was given the okay to work the land if we clear it. Greg was, what? <laughs> if we clear the land, we can use it. So he cleared the 50 by 50. And eventually, Greg cleared the entire thing. Next slide. Now look at this slide. This is what was happening. You see the back? That's all of the overgrowth that was on the farm. Greg is sitting in the tractor. Ann is smiling. Greg is not. Because <laughs> he was clearing the land that he thought he would get paid to clear. And he did the whole thing for nothing. Because his wife had a dream. Okay. Ann's father, Joe Mendez, not only helped with the clearing of the property, but he has invested heavily in the farm operation. In 2008, which this shows 2008, and that they were working out on the farm, a few projects were completed. The house and the barn on the property and the grounds were restored. The irrigation system was installed on one acre, 12,000 pounds of produce was harvested and donated to food pantries. And after that, the town of Brookhaven under the Land Preservation Program purchased the development rights for seven acres of the farm. It was an 11 acre farm to preserve it for farm use only. The other four acres could be developed at the discretion of the church. Next slide. Now here you see volunteers along with Ann. That's Peter Casperano and Elaine Gavangelia. I think I said it right. They work on the farm now. They've worked on the farm for years. Peter is in his 80s, and I think Elaine is in her 80s. And I dare any of you to go out and work with them. <laughs> You'd probably be crawling home. Because I'm telling you, they move, they do it all. And so does Anne. So in, 19, in, in 2009, the friends of the farm approached the church again. But this time it was to incorporate the farm. And they came with the idea that it would become a 501c3. And the church gave the approval for them to go forward. The original members of the corporate board were Lindy Cook, a member of Bethel, Thomas Lyon, right over there. He was one of the friends of the farm. Ann Pellegrino, and Elizabeth Takakarajan. Ooh, that was another one, got me. <laughs> but yes, they formed the corporation and put everything together. During the same year, the house on the property was fully renovated and rented to Peter and his son, who also agreed to volunteer on the farm. Um, important slides. Now we got a Department of Environmental Conservation grant and that grant was to um, install a well and expand the irrigation system. Next slide. The Civic Association of Center Reach went and installed a bathroom in the basement of the house. Next slide. This is where we received a grant from um, Suffolk County legislator a moratorium, moratorium, and it was a community support initiative grant. Next slide. This was the building of the greenhouse, which we need in order to get the plants ready for planting the next year. That was being built, it started in 2010, it was completed in 2012. 
Also, the irrigation system was expanded in 2012 to cover the entire farm. Next slide. We also got a grant from the Christopher Reeves Foundation because we put together and created a wheelchair garden. And the wheelchair garden is for people who are in wheelchairs can go out and garden and really enjoy the outside. So that, that is a wonderful thing and a wonderful feature at the farm. Next slide. This is when the, uh, a lot of work was being done on the wheelchair garden. These are all the volunteers and everybody that worked on putting it together. And you know who that is. He'll be up here in a minute. He looks fun. He looks different there because he's gotten older. <laughs> okay. But this is still the work that was done in, in the wheelchair garden. Everybody worked together, which is what happens on the farm. If any of you haven't been to the farm, please go because it lifts your spirits. It's a spiritual place, which you'll find out about later. In 2019, Hobbs Community Farm was honored at the Town of Brookhaven 28th Annual Black History Month. Uh, greetings, greetings, greetings. And uh, thank you, uh, Supervisor Muratari, because your comments really, I think, lead into what Bethel uh, Hobbs Farm is all about. People coming together, regardless of color, to further the legacy of Mr. Albert Hobbs. I met Mr. Hobbs briefly uh, just before he passed on at our church. And I didn't realize all that he had done, but now uh, going back and reviewing the history and looking at all he's done, uh, the, the legacy left was that of a man of uh, honesty and passion, uh, but more so generosity. So Mr. Hobbs did a lot of things to not only run the farm and make money, but to give back to the community. And at that time, again, when he was very involved in it, it was, again, a very multicultural situations, which I'm appreciative of. First, I'd like to say that the farm really is a community farm, and without the community um, supporting us and backing us up, it wouldn't exist. Um, I really have to thank the Bethel um, Church, though, for um, really standing their ground. Um, a lot of people, when they saw the, the land in disarray and, and um, abandoned, um, a lot of people came forward and wanted to purchase the property for their own well-being and put up condos or, you know, housing developments and stuff like that. But um, they stood their ground. They knew Mr. Hobbs's vision. Um, he wanted it to remain a farm um, the, um, and used for children as well. And um, they really stood their ground and, um, and made that vision come true. So um, I, I just really... They have my utmost respect as far as that goes. Um, with the, the farm really is a community thing, and it's not one person, it's not two people, it's not three people, it's all of us together. And um, I see a lot of faces out here that have been at the farm and that have helped out, and I, I thank you for that. And, um, you know, it's, it's a community thing, and it's all run by volunteers, and um, we're just trying to keep the vision um, going. I can, we all don't know what... Um, the afterlife is, but I can envision Mr. Hobbs leaning over the balcony of heaven, sometimes pulling his hair out. What are they doing? And uh, other times just having a beam in his eye and a smile across his face and just, um, you know, thanking God that his vision has come true. So I thank you so much. And the final slide was the Stony Brook University awarded a grant for creation, for the creation of the community Roots Garden. And at this time, Brother Larry Corbett will come forward and tell me about the farm today. Good evening. Um, as uh, Reverend Lisa said and Ron has said, the farm is such a beautiful example of a man having a vision, going forth and serving the community, and then going through a Pause, and then someone in the community coming back and reviving it through the community. So again, the story with Ann Pellegrino is again showing how the friends of the farm came together and had an inclination to go 
and restore the farm to its original purpose. And then um, the community at large came together with her. Her leadership was instrumental, but again, the whole community saw what could come out of the farm. And it's just an incredible story of today, I'm gonna to show you how through that transition period, all the rubbish, all of the weeds, all of the trees, and it looked like it was just desolate and nothing can happen to it. And then you see what it looks like today. And as Brother Ron said, please go by the farm just to see what it looks like, number one. And you'll just be amazed at all of the things that we're doing there. Next passage, yes. So our, our, our vision remains the same. We want to be a uh, organization that engages the community. All throughout the transition, we engage the community to bring the farm back. In order for the farm to still go forward, we still need to engage the community. And that remains our vision. We want to continue to engage everyone, even you here today. This is one of the new uh, activities that we're doing. We need to promote the farm more. I can't tell you myself being at the farm, how many times a person comes to me and says, I didn't know this farm existed. So that's been something in terms of the board of directors. We recognize that we need to promote the farm more because it offers tremendous benefits when you actually come and see it and become aware of it. And our mission um, remains to be, just before I get to that, our mission remains to be a farm for all people. We want everyone, regardless of religion, color, ethnicity, et cetera, to come and experience the farm. This is a farm for all people. And so that's what we're pushing with that. I'm gonna just walk you now through the areas of the farm, go very quickly, because I understand we're running out of time. So I'm just gonna walk you quickly through the various, uh, these are the main areas of the farm. First, the Memorial Garden, and the Memorial Garden is an example of something that we want people in the community to come and experience, and it's not even farming. The farm we've seen over the years has become a place where people just can come and become into their spiritual dimension again. So we have a Memorial uh, Garden area where you can just come and sit. We have the waterfall running throughout the most of the uh, fall, summer season, and you just come and sit in the... Okay. So this is the Memorial Garden we have, uh, and what we're doing here, we had a, a leak, we had to pull out all of the stones and put them back in. But again, we encourage people, even when they come in the volunteer on the farm, just take a break. Go and just sit there and meditate and become one with nature again. This is something where, again, we're not just trying to get people to come there and just you know, work for us. We're trying to help people to get themselves rebalanced in terms of their wholeness. So this is what it looks like when it's running and um, we need to do some trimming on it, but it's up in the front of the property. And if you ever come to the farm, we would encourage you to come, just take some time and just sit there and listen to the water and meditate and be one with God again. Next slide, Pastor. This is obviously the greenhouse and the greenhouse is major for us in that all throughout the uh, winter seasons, we actually are taking seeds and planting them so they can germinate and start to grow. We can't put this um, in their infusate in the ground because the ground is just too cold and it's hard. But the greenhouse allows us to prepare months ahead for the farm season. So in this, uh, you saw, this is the greenhouse and it was a lot of work that went into actually building it. And you can, I just took different pictures of it, of how we ha now have a second greenhouse and this is all volunteer work. Without this farm, this greenhouse, the farm could not function. The next uh, major area is the uh, education garden. And Ron mentioned that it's been renamed for the uh, Reverend Leonard, but um, the education garden is unique in, we're not only trying to have people to come there to farm, we're trying to educate people about farming, the importance of starting to eat healthy again. Also, we use the education garden for a lot of school outings for again, children to get out and actually get and actually put their hands in soil. So we get a lot of activity in terms of schools coming and spending time in the education garden. And this is not our main growing area, but it does allow us to, you can see how we have bins and the bins are low to the ground so the children can get actually into the soil and easily help us to actually plant. And they learn things like weeding. Weeding is critically in terms of the farms that viable. So we are teaching them things in the education area so that when they are interested in coming back and working in the main area, they have the fundamentals down. So uh, this is an important area and we grow a lot of different things there to make it easy for people to, um, uh, particularly the educational area for young children to learn how to uh, grow things. Next one is the Garden of Ephraim. And the Garden of Ephraim 
Here's a very unique area, and Ron showed you about the Christopher Reeves Foundation, and um, this is an interesting area. Um, Ann's son, his name was Chris, and uh, he passed away. He worked a lot on the farm, and he got involved in a car accident that was serious for him, and he still wanted to come out to the farm. So Ann wanted to do things for her son and other people who she recognized. There's a lot of handicapped people who could benefit from just coming to the farm. So that was the concept behind this whole Garden of Ephraim was, again, getting the grant so that we could have something built that would allow people in wheelchairs. Now you're seeing people, I'm telling you, when you see people with handicaps come out to the farm and get a chance to actually do something like this, you can just see in their faces that it does so much for them. So this is just an example where the, we're not just there to grow produce and give it out. We're trying the farm to be a place where people with all different type of needs can get some support for their needs and things like this. The next area is our um, uh, production area. And this is where we grow most of our produce, and which is uh, vegetables and fruits to uh, feed uh, people. So we supply 12 uh, food pantry soup kitchens in terms of, we don't charge them anything for this. We produce up to 30,000 pounds of produce every year, and we give it out to food pantries and soup kitchens. Now, obviously the farm needs money to operate, but we don't make money our major focus. We give food out to the food pantries and get donations accordingly. And what you're just seeing here is some pictures of what has evolved with the farm over time. We were way out in the back in terms of growing all of our main produce. And it became a challenge. Uh, if you have to walk way out to grow things, get it back in terms of the uh, produce and the farm stand, et cetera. So these bins you're seeing, we've all, and these bins was again, Ann's idea. We have these bins and these bins were built by people in the community. It costs a lot of money for the wood, number one. They donated the wood and professional carpenters build these bins for us. So again, these are other examples of how people are coming together to allow this farm to uh, function and produce more and more and more. And these are examples of all different types of produce that we grow. And this allows us to uh, grow this and walk it up to the farm stand pretty quickly. So we've made a lot of improvements over time. So when we used to grow, we would lose a lot of our produce because weeds are the main energy besides drought of produce. And over time, uh, Anne has been able to get uh, architectural people and other farmers from uh, the university to help us to learn how to find weed prevention paper and put it down so that we don't, we used to lose probably about sometimes 30% of our produce because the weeds, you just can't keep up with them. Um, but now you can see that we're getting very creative in terms of printing down paper, we have a better um, irrigation system to allow us to produce even more. We're up to 30, 35,000 pounds a year, which for us as a relatively small farm, that's a lot of produce we can actually give out. Next, um, obviously, main area is the farm stand. And this is open, as Brother Ron said, on Saturdays from 10 to 3. And you can just see all the different assortment of things. And we tell people, and we even I actually just take food stamps. We are trying to serve everybody. And we have such a large variety. Generally, we will grow about 30 different types of um, vegetables and fruits. You're seeing a squash here. You're seeing uh, butternut squash over there. So we have a lot of different things that we grow. And the thing, main thing is we tell people, if you come to the farm stand and buy fruits and vegetables, it came out of the ground either the night before or the day that you're buying it. So you're getting really fresh, organic uh, produce and vegetables. So uh, those are the main areas of the farm. And the other thing that I say here is you get a lot of support from different organizations and individuals and churches in particular. Local churches help us in terms of donations financially and also sending volunteers. We get a lot of support from uh, local churches, a lot of support from civic organizations, uh, this is a picture of uh, even the, the government that was um, Mr. Lori Tory in that picture. Uh, Mr. Romain, a Romain and Powell supervisor in the picture, and Kevin LaBaz, an assembly good. person. So, um, you know, a lot of support that I have, we have a beehive in the fall. We actually grow honey. 
Rabbi Hyde. So that's another new thing here. And this is again an example of us making a road for this name after the Hall. The main thing I'm going to say in terms of this second community outreach is we are trying to not only have people come to the farm to volunteer just to work for us, but just to come and experience it and be part of it. So we have several things going there. We have a run the farm that happens every year. And this happens in August uh, of every year. And uh, this year, I think, is August on the slide, August the 12th. You go to our website, you'll see the actual thing. And that's simply a matter of people who like to run, have a chance to do something that they like to run and just find some tickets. Some of them that don't run, they walk. But again, the main thing is they're financially supporting the farm. This is a world of event for us. And it's getting uh, bigger every year and uh, technology allows us to actually capture people and what's going on. So that's also a major fundraiser for us, but it's a fun event where people can come and be part of the farm and not actually have to get out there working and getting dirty and sweating all that kind of thing. Um, next item that's not uh, going past is the Fall Festival, and that's uh, an event that is, this is a picture of last year. Over the last 10 years, the festival has just grown significantly in terms of the number of vendors, the number of activities that we do, and the number of things that people can do. And uh, you can't see it well, but we had so much of the people parking off at the table, all the trees and all. This is something I've been encouraging all of you to go to our website and come and be part of our fall festival in 2023. I'm promising it's going to be a good experience for you. So it's this, this example of all the different things we've got going on. And we had about 30 different events going on. So you're not going to be bored uh, for our fall festival. So please um, get the word out about coming to be part of our fall festival. Palm Lions is involved in that and the Building Bridge is okay. The festival was called the Unity Day. And here in the farm was being used to emphasize the unity of mankind. Mm -hmm. So people of all different types of religion and backgrounds came mm -hmm. to this event. So that's just another example. Again, we're trying to use the farm as also a place to bring people together. I, I still remember this. This was such a wonderful event, our uh, unity business. So thank you, Tom, for that, that whole concept. What a great. Last day um, I'll mention is uh, we are also a religious organization. So Christmas is very big for us. And uh, we see some familiar faces in there. Uh, but again, we try to bring people together for a, a number of different days. And that's an example of that. Usually, uh, and lastly, um, I'm going to just show the website. This is mm -hmm. So, again, this is the faith information is on our website. We encourage you to go to our website. We've got a handout document that will give you all of the information so you can keep it for yourself and hand it out to other people. Again, it's got a lot of information in terms of where we are, the hours of operation, and we need support always financially and also just buying stuff for us in terms of CD. So this here is part of the uh, handout uh, document you'll get. We'll card. We're trying to make it easy for you to pick it up and carry it around. That's but it shows you the things that you can uh, donate for a story on um, Amazon. We put together a wish list. You can go on Amazon, click on something. Volunteering, uh, we're very sensitive to farming. is a challenging thing for some people. So we make it relatively easy projects. If you call us, come out, we can arrange a very easy little project. We don't ask people to be farmers. You know, if you come out for an hour or two, that makes a big difference for us. So everyone's small, just come out and experience the farm. We'll give you something easy to do. If you like it, then we'll look to do even more. With that, we'll let you ask uh, clarification questions to us. Can I just thank everyone from Bethel for showing up and coming on out on this evening. Amen. God bless. I'm going to yeah, give Brother Manning and, and, and Brother Corbett the closing words because they had lived the farm for I don't know how many years uh, on the board of directors. And not just that, working literally on the farm. I would just say that, uh, like Tom said and uh, Reverend said, uh, the farm is a place for all of us to come together and keep mankind alive and stable. 
and uh, come to the yeah. floor. Be involved. We're not, not going to just work it hard and kill you. <laughs> just come and experience the farm. Come and be part of some of the events. And again, have not because you yes, ask not. We need funding. We need donations to keep the farm flourishing into the future. So visit our website and donate to what you can. We make it very easy for you. Bring your families out and let them experience the farm. We have all kinds of good events going on. And be a part of the farm maintaining the community. Yes. The farm is bringing the community together and be part of that meeting. Thank you. Thank you. The farm is the place that is spirit. It is where you will feel your inner core come into contact with God. That's how it is. Whether you're working or not, it still reaches your soul. You see, the royal garden, a beautiful place. It's very beautiful at Christmas. You should come for that celebration. The fall festival, you won't see anything like it. No, <laughs> but it truly is a place that's in your backyard that you can come and have a wonderful time. Right, Ben? Thank you again for coming out today. Thank you so much. Oh, one last thing. I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. <laughs> the farm is going to be at our farmer's market. Yes. At some point in the summer, yes. not selling vegetables, but yes. with information. So definitely sign up for our email so you can go when yes. they'll be out. You're on the spot. Agreed. <laughs>